eliminating ourselves. Whether or not we agree, this must be novel challenges us at the most fundamental philosophical level. Not bad for a blurb. So now that I've, we've laid all this on you for, for uh, quite some time now, for an hour, uh, eventually, you know, to indication arises, I'll read a few poems and perhaps Jim will want to have a few more things to say, but now let's open it up for Q&A or comments. First I'd like to point out, isn't it too bad that nobody speaks Esperanto? <laughs> I mean, that was just a brief overview of some aspects of Esperanto literary culture. Again, I point out, this whole world began in 1887 when there was one guy who spoke the language. And look at this wonderful world that came out of it. So, any questions? Uh, I think the lady in the far back is the first to raise her hand. Yeah, uh, what I'd like to know is, is there any kind of um, overseeing body or board that uh, would govern, for example, introduction of new terminology or, you know, is there a, is there a, is there a grammar book out for Esperanto or? Well, there are all kinds of teaching materials. There are books. Uh, a lot of it is available online. Uh, there are online courses for free, uh, along with tutors who will help you. Um, there is a postal course if you prefer snail mail. There are many, many different ways. Uh, well, I forgot to mention uh, that brochure there. Uh, have some links that you can visit to get more information, which will point you to other links. Also, before I forget to mention, I also have some copies of some uh, articles from the Esperanto Centennial in 1987. And that doesn't seem like that long ago, but I guess it was. And one article is from the U.S. News and World Report, and the other is from the Washington Post. And uh, they're both very interesting. And Remember, that was before the internet explosion, including an Esperanto link. But that, that the folding brochure has some links for you. Uh, I can give you some more later if you want to talk about it. Uh, I, I do want to answer your, 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 answer, your broader question. Now, one thing that we don't have in the United States or in English, English is, is developed according to, uh, in standardization in which kind of developed according to the free market. Uh, in other countries, in other places, you have like an academy. I believe there's a French academy, or maybe a Spanish academy. Probably nobody pays attention to it, but it exists. Esperanto also has an academy that nobody pays attention to. Uh, well, they used to, but I think that, you know, you can't, there's no way of controlling everything, everything what people do. So there is an Esperanto academy, like most academies, very conservative in modern times. You know, they, they're very cautious. And there was always an issue in Esperanto because they wanted to make it easy as to, you know, the rate of admitting new terms. And people were fighting about this from the beginning. It was the literary people, because they were writing poetry, that they couldn't just deal with a very limited vocabulary. They had to introduce neologisms, new words. And of course, other people were opposed to this. So th there were always fights about this. The academy was, was very cautious and conservative about doing this. But generally speaking, it's been uh, very influential literary figures that have influenced the vocabulary. And there still is a difference between words that you would use in poetry and that you would use in everyday language. You don't always use the same, the same words for, for both in, in Esperanto. So, um, and there are dictionaries, and again, it's a, it was a person with some type of authority as a cultural figure that wrote a dictionary. So for example, there's a Esperanto, just a plain old unabridged Esperanto dictionary called Tena Ilustrita Vortado, Complete Illustrated Dictionary. This originally was done, super, oh, supervised by, uh, I mentioned, uh, the Hungarian Kalman Kalochai. Well, his, his colleague, uh, Gaston Varenian, who was from France, so the name sounds German to me, at least part of it. Um, maybe it's from Alsace Lorraine, I don't know. But in any case, uh, he supervised, he was the editor in chief of the original huge Plan uh, of Street of Tower, 1970, which has a second edition that I can't afford, so I don't have it. Um, so that's really, uh, but it's, it's sort of freelance. People, like literary people, will publish a book, and maybe at the end they'll have a list of, of non-standard terms, things that they've created that they use. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, of how things get accepted, it's partly dependent on the dictionary, slightly dependent on the academy, and on everyday usage. You know, slang terms. Slang usually arises unsupervised, and there is certain
different types of slang terms. Of course, people also had to agree in terms of various obscenities and vulgarities because it was part of human existence. As I say, it started out as a high culture, it only got low down later on. Um, so I hope that kind of answers your question. But for practical purposes, yeah, you, there's dictionaries, there's, I'm sure that uh, there's guides for pronunciation. I think the website to go to to learn about Esperanto or to learn the language is lernu.net, L-E-R-N-U dot N-E-T. And there they have something that we didn't have when we were kids or teenagers, was, you know, online guides and multimedia. You know, we just had to go to the library and blow the dust off the shelves and, you know, take out a library book and learn it on our own. But times have changed. So I hope that answers your question. I'd also like to uh, add that uh, I, and I think Ralph, something else we had in common, we both taught ourselves the language when we were about 13, and, and neither of us needed anything but a book. That's all you need. You, I don't think that's true of any other language. You can just read how it's pronounced, read the rules of grammar. There are only 16 basic rules. Uh, and so I practiced Esperanto myself. I was in a suburb of San Diego where I didn't know if there were any other Esperantists. There were, but I didn't know about them. So I became fluent on my own. And you could do that in Esperanto, probably only with Esperanto. And then when I met other Esperantists in San Diego that I hadn't known about, I spoke fluently to them. Never have spoken to anybody else before. Uh, Greg, I'm sorry. I have about 30 questions, and I'm not exaggerating my mind, but I'll just keep it down to two. Uh, first of all, is there any university in the United States that teaches Esperanto? And if the answer is no, why? I know you may not know for certain. The other question actually has to do with what you, you were talking about. Uh, Esperanto being a living language. As we all know, you get new words added to the English, any language every year. It's increasingly harder. What's the standard? In other words, who decides how certain things are going to be translated? You have to have some standards, I assume. In other words, I mean, like, say, for example, you have a, I don't know, the word Twitter. You know, that's one we all know. Who decides what Twitter is going to be in Esperanto? I don't know, do you? I think with, with certain things like chemistry or you know, economics, there are specialists who've written dictionary, but in terms of like things that come up, especially because of the rapid development and the popularity of this technology, because I mean, I don't use Twitter, but other people do, and I'm not sure who invents these things. The people basically uh, do it on their own. Uh, just a certain standard develops and whichever becomes most popular. I've always said, I think the Academy of Esperanto ought to be in the business of every year deciding, okay, these are the new terms that have come, come up, what are we going to officialize and what not. But it doesn't want to do that. As Ralph said, they're very conservative. Uh, so uh, in lieu of that, new words and terms and expressions come up anyway, just like with any other language, except Esperanto doesn't have a literal country where everybody's together, but it's a worldwide virtual country. So people virtually communicate in most cases. Uh, and come up with new uh, expressions and words on their own. So it's a usage, basically. You yeah, know, I think that the computer yes. nerds. But what happens if you have, I guess I'm turning this into a longer question, what happens if you have a dispute about, you know, what this should be? I mean, do you have some kind of a deciding body? I guess that's really my question. No. The Academy should be, in my opinion, but it doesn't. So well, just, just whatever becomes most popular. And sometimes there are parallel terms, like Facebook, some people say, uh, say uh, Visage Libro, which is a literal translation of Facebook. And some people say Facebook, which of course is a transliteration of the English word. And most Esperantists are happy to use both. So there's no, there's no standard there. It's pretty much whatever is based in you know, usage over time. You know, one that comes out over another. OK, and the other question had to do with universities in the United States. Does any of them teach Esperanto? If you wanted to take a language course in Esperanto, you know, level one course, for example, is there any university that teaches that that you know of? Not that I know of. What often happens in universities and also uh, public uh, secondary schools and elementary schools is that somebody who is either an Esperantist or likes Esperanto, who is a teacher already, introduces Esperanto to that school, usually as a sort of extension class in colleges or as a special activity once a week or something in, uh, in public schools. It always is very popular and, and the students like it, uh, but it's, it's haphazard for many reasons. It has been taught for credit in colleges. 
I'm not on the current thing. I actually did get a credit, a couple credits, you know, back in the 70s. The School for International Training in Federal War Vermont, which um, is interesting for many reasons, <laughs> as it's Vermont. Uh, you know, if you, have, if, if you have, if you're nostalgic for hippies, just go to Vermont, you'll have a ball. Um, but in any case, and Brattleboro is a perfect place, but there's a place in Brattleboro in the mountains called um, the School for International Training, which they train people with other languages, deal with other cultures. In 1975, I actually did take, and they, they had courses, and, and also it was at that time coincident with the national meeting. And they had courses like beginning and intermediate and advanced, I believe, and I probably took intermediate or advanced or something. And I think I got a college credit for it. I don't know if they're doing that now. The person involved, his name was Alvin Fantini, I believe. Um, there have been credit courses at times. I think San Francisco State University had summer courses. I don't know if they still do. And this thing that I mentioned, NOSC, which is a, a, stands for something I don't remember, maybe North American something. Summer, Somatical Summer. <coughs> North American Summer courses in Esperanza, um, they teach you in different places. I don't know whether they offer college credits or not. I think they do. They, uh, uh, in so Canada, there's, there's... Well, in, some, I once took another one from William Hall. It was from uh, at a place called Barrie in Ontario, a small town, on some lake or something in Ontario. And uh, it's a small college, and I think I might have gotten a credit for that. Of course, this was 1975, so what can I tell you? Mm -hmm. or, or 70s. Yeah, it was... Same year as Meadow World. It was around then anyway. It's a blur. Remember the 70s, you weren't there. <laughs> so um, uh, they, they probably do, but honestly, I'm not up on it. It's probably something you could find out on memory.net mm -hmm. so forth. But it has been done. But we haven't reached a point yet that we could like to do minor in Esperanto or even major. We're not there yet. In Hungary, you could, but not in the United States. So okay. I don't think we'll live to see that. I have other questions before we close. Well, I'm certainly, I think there was more than one or two hands raised. Anybody else have something to say? All right, first this gentleman in the second row. Is, is, there, uh, is there a field of journalism in, uh, in Esperanto? Yes. I mean, that's the way new words and, and new expressions and, you know, that, that's the way they get introduced into modern languages, I think. Of course, now with the internet, people can blog about all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. People do about current affairs. But there is a print publication that goes back a few decades called Monaco, which is, means month. Mm -hmm. And I assume it was a monthly. I'm trying to remember. I once wrote a few things for it. And basically, it's people who live on the scene of a particular area, and they report on something, whatever they're interested in. Mm -hmm. So it's a news magazine mm -hmm. in Esperanto. And you know, if you write for it, it's something that's probably going on in your own country, your own area. I can't even remember what I wrote about, but I wrote about something on 1990, and it's still being published. And I can't remember, well, they never paid me. I don't know if they pay like real authors. They probably don't, because uh, very few people get paid for anything in the Esperanto world. But um, uh, that exists, and I'm not sure what else there is. I mean, I suppose like if you were part of the peace movement, they would have their own little thing or part of something else, um, you know, some specialized group that has their own thing. But, but Monato, I'm familiar with, and of course now with the blogosphere where nobody has to pay subscriptions for anything, or has to have the expenses of postage and reproduction of paper, uh, there are some blogs that deal with news, with general news, and, and again, if you have some specific interest. So that stuff does exist. I haven't examined it to, you know, to look and see where the new term, the new words appear. And that would be an interesting thing to do, but I've, I've never done it. Yeah, there are Esperanto newspapers both uh, on in, in the internet and, and print. Um, of course, a lot of print, a lot, Esperantoio is going the way of the rest of the world and moving from print to virtual, of course. But there are all kinds of specialist interest publications about a particular country, uh, about a particular interest, religion. You know, there's Esperanto Catholic and Jewish and Protestant and Muslim and what have you publications. There's a great uh, magazine about China and Esperanto. Ditto Japan, Korea, all over the place. Um, so those account for a lot. Uh, some of them are have a more political uh, bent than others do. Uh, so there's there's all kinds of stuff like that. All right, I remember three other questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you can pick somebody. It's your turn to pick somebody. Did you have your hand up, sir? Yes, sir. Um, I think that we all can agree that in, in the digital age that we live, there, there are many ways of uh, propagating or 
something like language would be. And uh, I'm, my question would be, uh, has anybody thought about uh, using some of these digital means of, uh, of, of spreading the word and, and using the language? And two na maybe naive ideas come to mind, but as an example, for example, has anybody come up with uh, device, uh, designing any uh, particular uh, computer games in this language? Number two, for example, has anybody come up with the idea of um, devising um, uh, a monopoly game, for example, a table game uh, that uh, uses the language itself? They, these are cultural, uh, I would, if you can say low level uh, uh, things, but, but they, they, they create great impact and, and possibly great dissemination of the uh, at least interest in language. The answer is yes uh, to the game part uh, and also to the, um, to the first the second one's game. The first one was, um, I have a senior moment here. Um, digital means. Pardon me? Digital means. Yeah, digital means. Well, certainly in terms of games. In fact, I think there is an, es uh, an Esperanto Monopoly, Monopolo mm -hmm. online. I have one of my many web guides and bibliographies is to games in Esperanto. Uh, and mm -hmm. There are a few websites that deal specifically in games. I think there's a, an Esperanto, there's millions of Esperanto Facebook groups. I think there's one on games, Ludoi would be games in Esperanto. I have a, a lifelong, or mostly lifelong interest in board games. Um, and uh, in terms of, uh, there, there actually are some games that are just games you can buy in a store that actually were named, have, are named after Esperanto words. I mean, there's Esperanto words like um, Lactalo, I think there's one that's called. There's a few of them. I mean, you, re you read the rules in English, but the games actually are named after Esperanto words um, in terms of physical games you play. On the internet, there's a lot of stuff. And uh, one of my web guides, I think, is Games in Esperanto or whatever it's called. And that lists a lot of different websites where you'll find these things. Now, as it turns out, one of the many colorful stories I knew somebody in D.C. several decades ago, well, about 1890, I guess, who worked in the field of security, and he was, uh, he was, he had known Esperanto decades before he was a game inventor. He also claimed, well, he never, I don't know, he's probably dead by now, so maybe he won't die, but he never wanted other thing to tell anybody. I don't know why he was scared, but somehow he was involved, or said he was involved in the anti-Nazi underground, he didn't want anybody to know this. And, uh, you know, we were sworn to secrecy. That's why even if I remember his name, I wouldn't mention it. And I don't remember his name. But he, he invented a couple, actually, you could figure it out easily because he invented a couple board games. So I, I, I can't say I hope he's dead, but, uh, but if he is dead, he won't be angry at you. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, he invented uh, a couple board games, and he actually paid me to translate the rules in Esperanto. Now, the games are not online, but because I did put my rules in Esperanto online. There was two <coughs> games, one was called Constellation, and the other one was called Money Chase, I think. And, uh, you know, he had rules in English, but he wanted to do this. I guess he was an Esperanto teacher many decades earlier. And, uh, but he was, I guess, still paranoid. I don't know what he thinks is going to happen to him, you know, in 1990, whether some former Nazi is going to assassinate him. But he wanted to keep it secret. So the answer is yes. Thank you. But did I forget the first part of your question? No, I don't think you did. You addressed both of them. The, the, the second part was the uh, Monopoly game, board right. games, and you, you did it. I think there's an online but version of it. I've never seen it, but I have a picture of it on, on my webpage because I just took the image you know, the board. Now, the gentleman who's going to ask a question in the front row is left. Uh, <laughs> I text his patient a little too long. <laughs> uh, no, he had personally, he told me he had the waiver Oh, so I, I knew this anyway. He wasn't personally offended. Oh, okay, but we can get the, I can get the answer too. Uh, okay, other questions and comments? Uh, very good question. Uh, the gentleman, you said that you were in California and you met other people who spoke Esperanto. Mm -hmm. And uh, do they have like a club or some kind of. Uh, so they have something like that locally? Sure, absolutely. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we have the Esperanto Society in Washington. Yeah, uh, most urban areas and some not so urban areas have local mm -hmm. groups. Mm -hmm. Do they meet like once a month or something? Uh, more or less, yeah. depending on, on interest. We have we have a chat in Kosi uh, on the hill. Well, Kosi isn't there anymore. We'll have to find a new place. Oh, they closed? Yeah, they closed down. Wow. But sure. I'm sorry, sir. How about the uh, large organizations like the United Nations or large international corporations? 
Do any have any uh, formal use for Esperanto? Well, uh, both the UN and UNESCO have uh, endorsed Esperanto, and the Universal Esperanto Association is in formal consultative relations with uh, UNESCO, which means they consult with each other and inform each other and, and so on. Um, there's an Esperanto office right across the street from the UN. So there's been a lot of Esperantists work at or for the UN and or the European Union. So there's a lot of uh, close contact and collaboration. We obviously would like a lot more help. We think that Esperanto should be one of the working languages of the UN and or the European Union, perhaps particularly the latter. But you know how it is to introduce anything on a large scale at a big bureaucracy that's used to doing things in a certain way, that has its own interests. And in the case of language, the supporters of English or French or German or whatever uh, are just naturally going to be at least resistant uh, to it, if not hostile. Um, so all those organizations approve of Esperanto, at least in theory. Uh, but we keep working on them. <laughs> there is a, a history behind this, uh, which goes back to the League of Nations. After World War I, the League of Nations was formed. They had a commission to study Esperanto. They produced a favorable report in 1921, which is probably easily or hopefully not too difficult to, to, to acquire. But uh, the, the kibosh was put out. I think it was the French delegation that basically deep sixed it. The French were scared because English, um, I mean, not only because of the British Empire, but then because of the United States had become a global power. The French were scared uh, of this. And so they basically put the kibosh on Esperanto on the League of Nations. Uh, so so that, you know, that died. And then, thanks to the heroic efforts of a gentleman originally from Yugoslavia, Ivo Lakana, who headed the um, Universal Esperanto Association for two decades, in 1954, that's when um, Esperanto was officially recognized uh, by UNESCO, by the UN. Uh, the political problem is uh, obviously the, the problem. Nobody really cares on that level about what's more efficient, what will save money, and they can care less. It's power and, and influence money, and you know that uh, rules the world. Now, in terms of private businesses, yes, private businesses have used Esperanto in different ways. The Fiat Corporation in Italy, I think, produced a couple of you know advertising films. And they did it because there were Esperantists and Fiat that had some influence. In fact, a, a gentleman by the name of, of um, I can't remember his wife's name, I don't remember his first name, which is a little embarrassing. Not that I ever met with his wife, but the Grata Paglia is in Italy. Uh, Ursula Grata Paglia and, and her husband, who was in Fiat. <laughs> I think that he, they were responsible for this. It was my first mass meeting of, of Esperantists with this delegation from Italy and Europe. Because there was a rare Universal Esperanto Congress in Portland, Oregon, 1972. I think we only had like three here, two or three here in the United States in total. And uh, they passed through Buffalo. Everybody in Esperanto passed through Buffalo because they want to see Niagara Falls, not because they care about Buffalo. But that's how I met my first foreign Esperantists, usually one or two at a time, and I take Niagara Falls and show Niagara Falls. Um, but in 1972, there was like 42 of them showed up at the Statler Hilton Hotel in Buffalo. I'd never seen you know, more than two or three Esperantists in my entire life. And they all showed up babbling, you know, in Esperanto, like, right, and that was my shock. And the leader of the group was the Grata Palias. And so Fiat the Grata Palias. Now, interesting what happened with the Grata Palias is that I think they got tired of the modern industrial world as it was. And when I last saw them in 1977, they had started like a, some kind of a commune in Brazil that still exists. And I'm trying to think it's called Bona Bolo. Goodwill, or whether I'm mixing that up with something else. But they started working with local children or something, and they've been living, I guess, for the past, you know, 30, whatever it is, years now, in this in this rural area in Brazil. So he got tired of Fiat. So I don't know what Fiat's doing with Esperanto now. Maybe they've long forgotten it. There's been various businesses that have used it for promotional purposes here and there. Uh, and as I mentioned, it, it's a political uh, a problem. You know, uh, there's always a question, well, maybe the labor movement should adopt Esperanto. But, you know, nobody wants to make a big change. I think the, the, the people that were always most in favor of Esperanto were the anarchists, because they could care less about practicality or structure. So they said, well, you know, and all, it was the anarchists that, even going back to the 19th century, in the 20th century, um, some, many of the first Japanese and Chinese Esperantists, 
They were interested in modernizing their countries. They were breaking away from feudalism in the modern world. And in terms of the left-wingers, a lot of the anarchists were the first ones to embrace Esperanto. They even have like Esperanto columns in their newspapers. So go figure. <laughs> yes. Um, Oh, I can't remember. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add that uh, there are Esperantos of, Esperantos of all different kinds of political stripes. There is an Esperanto radical party in Italy who are actually quite active. And I don't, from what I've read of them, they're, they're not quite as radical as you might imagine for that title. But they're always having marches and rallies and, and things. There are very conservative, anti-communist organizations. On the other hand, the communist governments of Eastern Europe usually supported Esperanto, as does the Chinese communist government. So there are all different kinds of people. Yes. Uh, one more question. You, you, uh, you mentioned a commune where I would imagine that children would grow up speaking Esperanto, which would mean it would become a first language rather than majority a second language. Uh, do, do you know of any families that have raised their children speaking Esperanto? Yes, okay. there are some. I don't know about there. I honestly have no idea what goes on there. Uh, I mean, in terms of, of like, linguistic practices, I, I really do not know. Although I believe that Mrs. Gautapalli is on Facebook. I think I once said, hi, remember me from 1977? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I really don't know what they do. I haven't followed it. But yes, there are, in Esperanto, we call it Denaskai Esperantista, Esperanto from birth. And obviously, they're all bilingual. Because if they just spoke Esperanto, I think they'd be in big trouble uh, in terms of you know negotiating the, the rest of the, of the world. But um, but there are some. Uh, there's many. I don't know how many. Uh, they probably have their own. Uh, they probably have their own newsletter or organization. Or they know each other. I don't know. I knew one sort of back in um, in back in the 70s when I was in fact in Vermont. A gentleman by the name of Alan Bosch. Uh, he 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 would. Uh, he was very big. Uh, in the Esperanto uh, movement, American Esperanto movement, and he would speak to his son in Esperanto. I stayed with him after going to Brattleboro and taking that course. I stayed with him for a few days. And I just remember him scolding his son in Esperanto with a heavy Western American accent, you know. Um, and his son was like nine years old, telling, you know, like, uh, scatological jokes and that kind of thing. <laughs> so, uh, yes, there, there are many uh, native, well, actually, native bilingual speakers of that of Esperanto. Um, Which means there's uh, probably also Creoles. <laughs> well, I don't know what the language usage. I honestly don't know. I mean, the people that's yeah. written about it, maybe somebody's done a doctoral dissertation. I haven't studied it. And of course, there's a variety in terms of their loyalty, their interest, maybe their psychological well-being. I'm sure there's a, a variety across the board. Another thing that should be mentioned with or without children is people getting married. Um, that is, there are many Esperantos across the world who have met each other, and the only language they have in common is Esperanto. So they talk with each other in that. And then, of course, if somebody moves to another country, they have to learn the language of that country. But they'll still talk amongst themselves uh, in Esperanto. And I, we've had some of the, many of those people here in Washington because Washington attracts people from all over the world. And uh, that's another uh, thing. There's a pun in Esperanto, which I'm forgetting right now. I think it's called. What's it called? That pun? Oh, Esperanto? Yeah, Esperanto, which is like a pun for husband, for Agent. marriage, and, and Esperanto. You know, because, well, naturally, when people get together, that's one of the things that happens. Not to mention what happens without getting married. Mm -hmm. But we're only talking about the married people at the moment. Yeah, I, I know of several Esperantists from birth just in the U.S., mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of interesting because this is obviously a, not a very cosmopolitan country in terms of language. But I've known people in, in Texas and California and all over the place. I mean, it's a joke. You know, do you speak Esperanto? Hey, like a native. <laughs> That's supposed to be a joke, but there are people who are native Esperantists. You know, I should also mention, since the mores of the mainstream society have changed, one of the things you have in recent decades that would have been probably kept secret is you have gay Esperanto associations, you know? Uh, and, you know, wherever that is, you know, become more publicly acceptable, you know, you find, you find that being more explicit rather than, you know, being hidden as it used to be in the U.S. and all over the world, I guess. So all types of stuff exists, all types of interests, you know, whatever you're interested in doing, you can find other Esperantists that's interested in doing the same thing. Let's put it that way. Esperanto is great for networking, you know, that's the big 
key word of our age in the last few decades. And talk about a networking tool, uh, something that can make you friends all over the world. Now, it's not the only thing that can help you make friends all over the world, but as I, as I pointed out earlier, with Esperanto there's a special kind of commonality and camaraderie. So it's not just speaking the same language and being able to understand each other on a, on a basic level. There's more to it than that. If I hear you well, um, you both were exposed to the language early in your in your in your in your in your, in your, in your when, when they were children, uh, probably uh, ten years. I think it was uh, thirteen. Okay, it was probably fourteen. How old was I? Sixty-eight. Uh, I can't remember. I think fifteen, maybe. Yeah. The question is, <laughs> was that as a result of uh, was part of the. Uh, school curriculum, were you prodded by your parents? Was it pure chance or was it interest on your own part, on, on your own volition? Which of those? For me, it was a combination of pure chance and interest. Um, certainly, I actually tried to get the schools, you know, just being an ignorant teenager, uh, I tried getting to sort of, you know, talk to some schools before get in there. But no, it wasn't the schools, it certainly wasn't my mother, you know. Uh, She's never, she's never discouraged me, but she, she hasn't really shared my type, of my generally most of my intellectual interests. Um, so uh, it was really on my own. And, and my friend, I did this with a friend actually, Harry Bachman, who uh, I, partly because of Esperanto went on to get a PhD in linguistics from Harvard. I mean, just he had an interest in languages. And um, Harry actually is editor in chief of a recent volume of the most comprehensive. Yiddish English dictionary ever compiled. And it was, it was, he was working on it for decades, for years and years. And uh, I saw him publish it in the past couple of years. Harry's parents are Holocaust survivors. I grew up with many Holocaust survivors. Uh, and I think Harry might have learned about it. I don't even know where he learned it. He might have heard about it first and told me. And then we went to the library and we found him the address and we wrote away for stuff. But we basically learned it. We studied it separately, but then we would practice it with each other in my basement. We make up puns and jokes and all kinds of stuff. And eventually took the course, taught by as an elderly as Mirage's book, the Museum of Science. But this was a couple of years later. We just did it to bolster, you know, our command. But we, you know, we studied it in isolation, and I think partly it was um, you know, the idea of an artificial language is great. Uh, it's interesting, it's something that nerds do. Um, and also and, and there's other things. In those days, the only hobby the only hobby language that I kind of knew about was uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's novels, you know, Elvation, Dwarvish, and everything. Now we have this whole phenomenon called Conway, where people are just inventing their own stuff constantly, just, just trying out different combinations. You have the face of their social faith with groups on Conway. And of course, now we commission languages for science fiction movies to order. You know, it started with Klingon, and then there's Navi and Dothraki, and God knows what else. But when I was a kid, when I was a teen, an early teenager, we didn't have any of this. It, you know, you had Lord of the Rings, you know, for, for fantasy, and then for, well, I guess you could say reality, you had Esperanto. And there were writers to Esperanto, but they were, you know, they didn't really get very far. So, um, you know, that was the environment, and I think it, it's just a curiosity. I mean, actually, when you learn about Zamenhof and you learn about his history, uh, you know, that, that can be attractive. That, it wasn't idealistic motivation, it was just the interest in creativity, creating your own language. And, and it was something that you know, teenage, that certain kind of nerdy teenage boys used to do. Now there's more nerds that do this stuff. But in those days, you know, in the '60s, in my little environment, it was basically you know like maybe you know a couple handfuls of, of teenage boys that had these kind of interests, and that's what it was. And even creating your own little language if you wanted to experiment. With that area. And now you can answer. Sure. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm glad you uh, made up, uh, mentioned the con line. World, because it's an important point. Con lines indeed are a lot of fun. It's, it, uh, it's short for constructed languages. And it's become a, a rather popular uh, hobby or set of hobbies because there are lots of con lines. And you know, there's Klingon, there's something called Loglon, which was short for logical language. And then, of course, like everything else, there was a schism and some people wanted to reform it. So now most of them became Logebonners as opposed to Loglon. And uh, there's Navi, some people are, you know, from, uh, what was that movie called, Avatar, and now people are studying Navi. Okay, that's a lot of fun. Esperanto is fun too. 
It's fun to look at and say, hey, that's great. Oh, I see what he did. I see why he chose this way to say things. But Esperanto is the only con line that is widely and easily and fluent, fluently spoken by over a million people and has been widely used for a long time. You know, I don't think there are too many people, you know, they, they might play with, well, how would you say this in Klingon? But they don't, you know, I mean, the kind of Esperanto world that we described with all this literature, all this free conversation, this doesn't exist with any other Conway. And your early interest? Oh, okay, that's interesting. Uh, when I was 13, I got myself a dictionary called The Concise Dictionary of 26 Languages. And guess what the last was? You know, you look up a word, it's only a thousand words, and number 26 was Esperanto. What's that, Dad? Well, Dad said, well, it was an idea that people had once, you know, this crazy idea of an international language, you know, nobody speaks it anymore. Well, if you want to get a 13-year-old interested in something, what do you do? Get the father to put it down. Well, that's how it worked with me. Of course, I had to find out more about it. So I got a book about Esperanto from my local library, and it was both a book about it and a little mini textbook. And my goal originally was to learn about it, but I'm like, hey, I get it. Okay, all nouns and an O. What a great idea. Adjectives and A. Uh, great, wonderful. That's how I would do it. And I'd already been thinking about what would a world language be like. So I found out that another, and he started this when he was in his teens. So it was kind of like great minds think alike, I thought. Here was this fellow named Salmanhof, and his teens had started to think along the same lines. So I thought, well, he did it all for me. I don't have to uh, make all these decisions about how to structure a language. This is how it needs to be done. So I just went ahead and learned the language on my own, instead of learning about it. And within a short time, I was fluent. And I had that dictionary, too. And oddly enough, the only word that I remember looking up was cockroach. You know, I've never seen one in my entire life. Blato, <laughs> <laughs> Esperanto, and I found it 25 other languages. I don't know why I did this. I was a perverse mind. You know. There are a lot of really neat, <laughs> uh, neat touches about Esperanto. Just off the top of my head, O in European languages, all the Romance languages except for French, is a masculine ending, and A is a feminine ending. And that just seems to make sense. It just seems to be ingrained. I mean, even though we don't have we don't have the O A in English, but you know we have lots of feminine names that end in A. And I think we just instinctively feel that O is a masculine uh, vowel. Well, Esperanto doesn't have genders, but he decided that all the nouns would end in O. But he chose for the definite article the, the word la, which seems to be feminine by nature. Now, I don't know. Maybe he said that that was a conscious effort for gender balance. But even if, I think it was at least that subconsciously. La tablo. La Domo, and so on. So that's just one of the many things that struck me when I first learned about Esperanto. That's ingenious. And there are a lot more ingenious things to this company. One of the things that struck me, and, and it should be part of the teaching method, because some of the textbooks are better than others, is the, the way that it forms compound words. And my friend Harry and I, uh, one of my ambitions, aside from promoting this, is to be able to get funding to translate uh, Sotomayor's other futuristic utopian novella called Machine Bumbo, which means machine world, where you know computers, intelligent, artificial intelligence, uh, people create computers, get out of control, and they ultimately involves the demise not only of the human race but of all organic life. But in any case, um, and 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 I was it hasn't it's not in English yet. I want to translate it. The people in utopian studies want to read it because they don't know English, and I'm not sure it might be in Hungarian, but they don't know that either. Um, anyway, uh, the compound word thing, uh, I'll just give you an example, because the first line of Machi Mondo, Harry and I had to think about, because we, we were just getting used to this, and uh, it, it, it starts with H.G. Wells uh, appearing to the, uh, out of the time machine, and uh, it, it, it started, the first sentence, I still remember, is saluto mi diris en pachante. Now what that means is, greetings, he said, as he stepped in. However, as he stepped in is one word in Esperanto, which literally translated would be in steppingly. That is, en for in, posh for step, on for present participle, and e 
for adverb. So instead of having a whole phrase, you'd say, and pachante. Now that particular thing has been exploited to death by Esperanto poets and others because you can say things very eloquently, concisely, and sometimes uh, untranslatably uh, in Esperanto. But, you know, that's one thing that I got used to. Now, not all the textbooks exploited this. Uh, I think all wrote an introductory textbook, which is out of print. Somebody brought my copy in 1976 and never gave it back, so I, I don't know what to do. But uh, I think he tried to teach this. Because the more you become accustomed to thinking in Esperanto, not in English, you can exploit this, uh, this uh, agglutination, it's called, making compound words, and being able to, try to switch from one part of speech to another very easily without the awkwardness. Um, so that was, I think, one of the most interesting things, and, and I suppose the one thing that, uh, you know, that um, can stimulate your creative juices. Absolutely. You can make up your own words, um, and everybody will understand, even if no one has used that word before. Because of affixes, and then simply putting together root words. There's a very funny poem by Ald, the Scottish poet called the Brio, which means uh, drunkenness. And it's a poem illustrating somebody in a bar drinking, and it's, very, it's a very funny poem. And it's very creative, too. Uh, and it's talking about somebody who's just drinking and drinking, and he gets drunker and drunker, and you can see it in how the poem develops. And he starts, he starts noticing a woman at the bar, and he starts lusting after her. But I mean, the, there are a lot of words like, for example, sento dente, which means tempting the senses or tempting the feelings. But I mean, that's not an ordinary word, but he made it, and it's perfectly understandable. So there's a lot of that in Esperanto, and also conversation. And even in the, uh, Doctrinal expressions like mal ne, which means the opposite of no, in other words, yes. And there are others which are, uh, well, I won't mention here, but I Right. Uh, I think, uh, of course, we're, uh, I think we're somewhat running out of time, but I just want to see what I can squeeze in. I think I'll, because it's so brief, I think I'll, I'll, I'll begin with um, possibly the first original poem published in Esperanto by Zahman in the first book called Homi Accor. I'll read it in Esperanto and then English. They throw us a little dry, but I'll see what I can do. Ho mia cor, ne batto mal tranquille, el mia brusto non ne salto fuor, yam te di mi ne povas mi fazile. Ho mia cor, ho mia cor, pos longa laborado, ciu mi ne vengos en decida por, suffice, franquidicio del batado. Ho mia cor. Now there's an English translation courtesy of Marjorie Bolton, who's a, actually a literary critic in her civilian life in Britain. And uh, the translation for this can be found in her biography of Zamenhof, uh, written in 1959, published in English. Oh my heart is the title. Oh heart, my heart, do not throb so wildly, nor wildly from my bosom throbbing start. I cannot be composed, sit calmly, idly. Oh heart, my heart. O oh heart, my heart, the crucial hour is coming. Shall I not win when I have played my part? Enough, be calm. No more of this wild drumming. O oh heart, my heart. Well, very simple lyric, and lyricism pretty much dominated Esperanto poetry for several decades. Although in the Soviet Union it took a somewhat different tack, more sophisticated in certain other ways. I don't think I have time to get into that. But um, uh, the, the most important poet he didn't have as much influence on the hearing of college. I was a Russian poet. I think he was one of the people shot in 1937. Mm -hmm. Eugene Nikolsky, who did more than anybody else, opened up using, exploiting these compound words, experimentalism, very lush use of language, and not writing, writing, let's say, somewhat, somewhat less respectable things in some cases. And also because the, of the Russian Revolution, everything was changing. So he was anticipating a whole new world, which, of course, didn't come about as expected. And he wrote and a book of poems by him. It's published in 1929 called Pro Loco. It's now online. And I had the original edition, but some of these books never sell out. That's one of the problems. <laughs> uh, and um, on the title page is a picture of like a skull and, and, and a dish, and, and then there's this big sun rising. And prologue, in other words, something new is happening. And, um, he uses, he goes all out in terms of language. He could do this in English without embarrassing yourself because, you know, the, the nature of the American language has changed. You know, we don't write like people wrote in the 19th or 18th century. But um, 
he, uh, he writes some really peculiar stuff. I mean, just to give you a couple of first lines of, of, of one of his poems. Um, Aspergas mi per sperno del espero virgino de argenta astro, which literally means, I am not with, wait a minute, it's hard to translate, uh, holy, I anoint with holy water as asperigas. I anoint with holy water with the sperm of hope, the virgin of the silver star or heavenly body. As you can see in those very lines, he's combining the ethereal and, of course, you know, sperm. And uh, <laughs> this seems to be an obsession of his. No other Esperanto author at that time would write writing this kind of stuff. Uh, that wasn't going to happen until a little bit later. But uh, he wrote very musical stuff. I, 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 because I don't have an English translation, and I don't think he even had to do a decent one, he wrote very sort of lush, you know, over-the-top things. And somehow it works. I don't know why, because it would be an embarrassment to try to do that in English. But he was writing in the 1920s, and then the early 30s, because of the Stalinism, he was forced to write sort of political agitprop, but that didn't save him, and he ended up being killed along with everybody else. Um, but anyway, that's lyricism. And uh, before we do a couple more questions, I want to squeeze in at least one more thing. Common uh again, I'm just picking Esperanto poems and having English translations because otherwise you, know, it's, you get more out of it, hopefully. Um, and I'll, I'll do one by Kalochai, the Hungarian, uh, uh, outstanding Hungarian Esperanto poet. This was translated by a fellow I know by the name of A.Z. Foreman who's a translator that translates into like hundreds and hundreds of languages, ancient, medieval, and modern. I don't know how he does it. I think he lives in Tacoma Park. I haven't met him yet. But he translated a bunch of Esperanto poems on his website, I think called Poems in Translation. So he did a, he did a few. And here's one uh, by Kalman Kalochai, which of course in English would be called Sundown. But I'll read the Esperanto one first, then the English translation, and then we'll see if we've got any seconds left. OK, this is uh, Sun Subiro. Yam ichis kupro, la tabmeza or, chel horizont la sun a dialuma, o kul gigante granda, blor bruluma, re rigardante passas, drone and for. Kaik vaza san fluinta jus el cor, yen arda rujo, sur fenestro doma. Moment, kaik estingichas ruj fantoma. Cayena tom, rabite pril tresor. Maluma tom, lumo lam me chutas. Chul mastro dormas a eterne mutas. Pluline becos damaten radia. Malum, maluma, malum tralam domo tuta. Rigardas noto na fenestro muta. Cun rosma seca vitro apatia. Chul irrevidos vi. Let me read this in English, translated by Mr. Easy for me. The noonday gold is tainted copper brown. The sun with goodbye rays low on the sky. A blinking tear inflamed gigantic eye with backward gaze goes off in a slow drown. As if blood ebbed right from the heart. Here lies a red blaze on the window of the house. A moment and the spectral red is doused, and now the house lies plundered of its prize. House in the dark, no light from lamp or wood. Is the master asleep or mute for good, never to wake to ray rich dawn again? All through the house, no light, no light, no light. The muted window fixates on the night with one dew moistened apathetic pain. Shall we, my darling, Ever meet again? Okay. I think we have time for one more question. All right. It's 155. Yes, sir. If you want to grow uh, Esperanto, I think you should try to get the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts to have a merit badge incorporated with the language. There is. Or at least used to be. There is an Esperanto merit badge. Oh. And this is a scout. This has been a Boy Scout League or an Esperanto Boy Scout group for decades. Mm -hmm. I've never been a scout, so I didn't even know, but uh, it is a merit badge, huh? Mm -hmm. Great. Is there a Girl Scout merit badge, too? I don't know. There mm -hmm. should be. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, I have a quick question. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, I don't know how many people are aware of this, but uh, in 1966, there was an Esperanto movie called Incubus. Oh, yes. Did I pronounce that correctly? Mm -hmm. With yeah. William 
Shatner, who we all know from Star Trek. But as far as I know, there hasn't been an Esperanto movie since. Um, what do you generally know about that? Is there, I mean, how come that hasn't been used well, as a means to promote culture? I can tell you uh, something about the history. I mean, in terms of art films, or, or even bad art films, if you tell us. By the way, the creator of Incubus, Leslie Stevens, was the creator of the landmark TV science fiction show, The Outer Limits, 1963-1964. One of the great shows of the 60s, along with Twilight Zone. So, um, actually, uh, in terms of, you know, not, in, not fiction, but in terms of, I'm sorry, in terms of fictional films, there was one film produced just in Esperanto as an independent sort of amateur effort called Anguro in 1964. Uh, anguishes, or uh, Anguro means anguish, doesn't it? Uh, or plural somehow, anguishes, or however you want to translate that. Uh, it disappeared for decades. Um, and somebody finally found out. I don't know if it was disappeared on purpose because somebody was changed it. I don't remember. But uh, it's actually now, I, I mean, I downloaded it, so I found it on the internet. But it, for a while it was resurrected and, and it was on VHS. And I don't know where it went there. Uh, so that was in 64. Incubus was an experimental film. Leslie Stevens, who created the Alrighties, didn't know Esperanto, but he did it. It was done in bad Esperanto. I think I saw it once, so I don't know if it was bad acting as well. But of course, whenever I think of it, I think it's fun. Um, and since then, there have been films. Now, in terms of mainstream films, Esperanto has been used as an element of mainstream films, going at least as far back as Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator, 1940. All the signs in the Jewish ghetto are in Esperanto. Uh, there's reasons for this. He had to use his own money because the American film industry was in bed with the Nazis throughout the entire decade. They were in bed with the Nazis. They didn't want to offend the German government. That also accounts for a film, I believe, with Clark Gable and somebody else did a film called Idiot's Delight. And because they, didn't, they were afraid of offending the German market, whoever made that film, uh, when they were in a foreign country, instead of speaking German, they spoke Esperanto because they didn't want to lose the German market during the Nazi period. I haven't seen Idiot's Delight yet, but someday I will. I have seen The Great Dictator, one of the most important films in history. And the, the tramp, the silent, the, the little tramp, finally speaks at the end. The most important speech that's ever been made in the history of cinema. In 1940, at the Fabian Man, the Hundred Pounds. Esperanto's in that film. I, I believe there's a little bit of Esperanto in the film Gattaca, although I don't remember where it comes in. Um, uh, there's a, an outfit which doesn't use Esperanto, but it's called Esperanto Filmoy or something. I think they did uh, Pan's Labyrinth, was it? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Gravity. Oh, well, yeah, but that too. Um, Esperanto has been used incidentally in mainstream films. Uh, in terms of films entirely in Esperanto, I think Esperantists have produced some since, many since, and of course, now there's videos and YouTube. So there's stuff you know, for an Esperanto audience, and there's a website that um, tries to document it. It's, I think it's called Filmoy something, F-I-L-M-O-J dot, it's either or or net or one of those two, I think. And there, they try to keep a database of all of this stuff. Um, but in terms of things for mainstream audiences, or even weirdo audiences, like Incubus presumably was in the 60s, um, I mean, that's what comes to mind. Yeah, there are uh, Esperanto radio broadcasts and radio stations and internet radio stations, Polish radio, Vatican radio. There's a new Esperanto TV, internet TV channel called Esperanto TV from Australia. I don't know why, but they, they did it. And so uh, they have a repertoire of uh, films that have been made in Esperanto, little dramas, uh, all, all the documentaries about the Incas, all kinds of so there's a lot on the internet. Well, it's two o'clock, so we should leave here. Yeah, I think I'd like to invite everybody to uh, enjoy uh, some snacks, and let's continue the discussion informally. Uh, let's uh, thank our presenters. <laughs> uh, actually, they've mentioned some things. I pulled them up on the, the uh, computer.